Well, it's a great pleasure for me to, to be with you today. When uh, Brooke asked me to come here and sent me an uh, invitation, I was conflicted in the sense where I wasn't sure I would be able to make it because I had an international engagement. But in looking at the subject matter and the topic, I felt that it was an important enough to do my best to come here today to talk with you about this issue of lawfare, international law, international tribunals. And from what I've been able to see today, we've had a full discussion and conversations on the problem. The problem as we see it, as we know it, with lawfare, universal jurisdiction, is that there is an effort to criminalize states' rights to defend themselves, to criminalize warfare completely, and to remove the issue of accountability and pursuing accountability from its rightful place, which is within the hands of the states, and move it up to some international mechanism. Now, I think there's a time and a place for international tribunals, and we'll talk about it in a moment. But what you're seeing here is that there is an effort by people to create subject matter jurisdiction over these crimes, genocide, crimes against humanity, and war crime, and place that subject matter jurisdiction into the hands of an international court, full stop. Now, during my experiences as ambassador at large, I saw this, this issue come, in, come into play. And as early as in 2001, when we began the uh, offensive in, in Afghanistan, Shortly thereafter, I remember the new High Commissioner for Human Rights, Mary Robinson, began to advocate that the United States needs to be brought before a tribunal because we were preventing a shipment of food from moving through Afghanistan. And she was calling that a war crime. When the reality was that we were preventing that shipment of food from moving because it was an offensive taking place and we wanted to protect the safety of the personnel moving the food. So we prevented it for a few days. We know about all the other universal jurisdiction activities that people have talked about here. We saw them again during my tenure as, as ambassador at large. But where we need to be, where international law, international judicial mechanisms need to be, is where it all really began. That is back in the hands of the states. I think that we have lost our way. We are making the assumption we got caught up, and when I say we, the world, in the glory of the idea, the noble aspect of creating this world court that would be above all and, and hold perpetrators and leaders account. In some circumstances, that is good, but not in all circumstances. We are better off using our effort, working with states, working with these societies that are struggling to build the rule of law, to build the legal capacity so that they can do it themselves. I always say to people, if you have every state prosecuting, judging, holding persons account for offenses that occur within their territory, by their leaders, by their military, by their citizens, imagine the reach of the rule of law. It is worldwide. It is not just in a court that is sitting in The Hague. So we need to redouble our efforts. Rather than the international community pouring all these mo this money into the tribunal, the ICC, we need to rebuild our effort, redouble our effort at working with the states. Because the rule of law will be the barrier to impunity. Now, one point that I always make to folks when I speak on this issue, I bring them back to our election in, in uh, 2000, and people say, now, Pierre, why are you talking about the election in 2000? I think it's an important example of the rule of law, where we, our country, had the changing of a presidency, the most powerful office in the land. That decision was decided in a court where half of our population did not agree but in the end, we respected the outcome. We respected the judicial decision, and there was a peaceful transfer of power without a single person being jailed, killed, or injured. That shows a respect. 
for the rule of law. And that is because we've had years of practice of doing it here ourselves. We've had our, our, our problems. We've had our own corruption. And we continue to have the problems. It's not perfect. But by taking ownership in the process, it has grown to the point where it is respected. And that is what we need to have happen in the international community and not a situation where people that we've talked about today are moving to advocate what I call the subject matter jurisdiction over these offenses. But when Brooke asked me to come and speak, she said, Pierre, can you please speak on where these efforts actually work? Well, one of the places where it actually worked was in Rwanda. I had the privilege, the honor of being uh, the lead prosecutor for the United Nations Criminal, International Criminal Tribunal for Rwanda, where I prosecuted the first case of the tribunal, which also happened to be the first genocide case in the history of the world. We came in as an international team from all over the world, from North America, Europe, Asia, Africa, South Asia, the list goes on, to come together to build a judicial mechanism to help a society that had been devastated. A society that in 100 days lost one million people. A million people in 100 days out of a population of eight million. With that, within that 100 day period, you had another two million first people flee the country to Zaire. Now three million people are gone. The infrastructure was destroyed. The human resources were non-existent. So when it came time to rebuild a population or a country, a population, a judicial system, the tools did not exist within Rwanda. Those that were still alive were devastated. Now we can get into details about the genocide, but I don't need to do so here. Because we know how a genocide not only impacts that immediate population, but impacts generations to come. So where the international community came in, where the law worked was in a situation like Rwanda, where we came in, Hamas, and began to go after the perpetrators of one of the most egregious crimes in our times. That is where it is useful. Now, we've seen this go on in other places. We know about Yugoslavia. We know about Sierra Leone. But one of the things, as it relates to Rwanda, that I would have done differently, now, now hindsight, I think it was the right thing to do, as I mentioned, but what I would have done differently, looking back at it now, would be I would have put a valve in the process. And here's what I mean. We came in 100% international, right thing to do, poured all sorts of money into the system. But what we should have done is created a process that as the life of the tribunal moved along, we created and inputted more domestic participation. So by halfway through the life of the tribunal, it's 50-50, international Rwandan. And at, in its final years, it's prim primarily domestic and Rwandan. Because again, we need to build the capacity so that these things do not happen again. There's a movement that we know, and that movement is strong. There's a movement to make the ICC, the court, the end-all, be-all court for all these processes. But do we really think, putting aside the political, legal differences, do we really think that the ICC is capable of meeting these objectives? Imagine if the ICC decided or was able to gain jurisdiction over all the offenses in the world. It would collapse. It would collapse. It can barely handle the cases it has now. Now, how is it supposed to bring justice to the world when it can't even handle these few conflicts that it's been assigned? The other point which is the most important point for me, and I'm, I'm going to wrap up because I, 
I think it's important for us to get to question and answers. Is, is this following question? Do these international tribunals in general really bring justice to the people? I raise this because here is what I saw in the Rwanda context. Yes, we got convictions. Yes, we held these people accountable. Yes, the Rwandan population was pleased, but they weren't part of the process. There are many times during our trial, we were in Arusha, Tanzania, where we were litigating this case day in and day out, and I was getting messages from people in Rwanda, from the victim community, that had no idea that justice was taking place on their behalf. And when they came into the process, it was completely foreign. Not only was it a foreign court with foreigners, but the process itself was foreign and different. They could not understand it. And the problem you have when you have something like this is that a society has the ability to accept or reject the outcome. There's no ownership assigned to it. Therefore, the rule of law does not take hold. Fortunately, they accepted it in that situation. But going back to the ICC, we, uh, we heard someone mentioning Sri Lanka, which obviously needs to be addressed and there needs to be prosecutions. But can you imagine that if these Sri Lanka matter were referred to the ICC, do you think that the farmer on some hill in Sri Lanka would have any idea that justice is being administered on his or her behalf 10,000 miles away in The Hague? The answer is no. Do you think that that farmer would embrace the results as we did in 2000? The answer is no. So we need to find a way to bring this back to the local setting. We can use international law at the local setting. Let's have the states administer the rule of law. And I leave you with this one question, which I ask a lot of people. For whom are we seeking justice? If we're seeking justice for ourselves, then you can create all the international tribunals you want. You can prosecute these cases wherever you want. But if we really believe that the purpose of pursuing justice is to serve and help the people who are most affected, most abused, if, that is the, if the answer is that is what we're trying to do, then we have to bring it back home so they can touch it, taste it, feel it, and be part of it, just as we have done here. Thank you very much.